It wasn't very sporting of me to shoot them from cover before they knew I was there, but circumstances demanded it. There were six men in the clearing. One man was holding a knife to a man's throat, another was pointing a gun at a woman, and the third was ripping the clothes off a young woman. My first shot hit the knife wielder in the forehead and he fell like a marionette whose strings had been cut. The man holding the gun turned at the sound of the shot and my next bullet ripped his throat open. The man ripping the woman's clothes off stepped back from her and raised his hands above his head in the universal sign of surrender. But unfortunately for him, I took no prisoners. My third shot was another shot to the middle of his forehead. I had no problem killing them. They weren't even close to being the first. Uncle Sam had taught me how to do it and then made sure I had plenty of practice shooting the bad guys. After taking out the three, I stayed put to see if there was anyone nearby who might be a threat. A man and a woman hurried over to the woman whose clothes were being ripped off. As I watched what was happening in the clearing, I thought back to the circumstances that had brought me to where I found myself. I was in Texas, a little south of the Presidio. I was hunting wild hogs and had just settled down to sleep in my sleeping bag when I heard a woman scream. I grabbed my AR-15 and went to see what was going on. I got to the trees surrounding a small clearing and watched what was going on. It wasn't hard at all to figure out who the bad guys were, and I massacred them. The one who tried to surrender had to die as well, as I wasn't going to involve local law enforcement. In fact, my wild boar hunt was over, and by dawn I hoped to be halfway home to Colorado. I was curious as to what was going on. I walked out into the clearing with rifle in hand and headed toward the three in the clearing. As I approached them, I pointed to the one whose clothes were being ripped off and asked if she was okay. The man, clearly Hispanic or probably Mexican, since we were near the Texas-Mexico border, said in fairly passable English, She's all right, senor, thanks to you. I learned that he had paid the owner of the knife and gun to smuggle him and his family into the United States and deliver them to a cousin who lived in Las Cruces. They met the two men near Ojinaga, and as soon as they crossed the border, they met a third man who was to take them to Las Cruces. They were led to a clearing, and the man said he needed some sweetener for what he was doing and started tearing at Juanita's clothes. I asked where their car was, and he said it was parked a little farther down the road from the clearing. I asked him if he knew how to drive, and he said yes. I walked over to the bodies and searched them. I found 3,000 on the guy with the knife and another 2,000 on the other two. I handed it all to the man, his name was Roberto, and told him to get his family in the car, follow me, and I would drive him to Las Cruces. It was only a five-hour drive, and when I got them there, I waved goodbye and headed for Denver. Because I cut my trip short, I returned three days early. I was surprised to find the driveway to my house clogged with cars. I assumed that my wife Anne had probably invited some of her girlfriends over for a card party. I went inside and discovered I was half right. It was a party, but no cards were in sight. Steph, Anne's best friend, was being entertained on the couch by some guy I didn't know. Bess, one of the girls Anne worked with, was bent over the back of a chair, and she was being favored by a guy Anne worked with whose name I couldn't remember. Seeing this, I had no doubt what I would find when I got to our bedroom. As I passed the spare bedroom, I looked in and saw that Anne's brother, Tom, was sleeping with another of Anne's co-workers. As I approached our bedroom, I heard a male voice call out, I'm almost done, who's next? When I got to our bedroom, I saw that I was right. Anne was lying on our bed, having fun with her boss. Did I mention I got out my phone and filmed the whole thing? I suppose it goes without saying that my appearance caused a bit of chaos. Steph saw me, shrieked, oh shit, and tried to get out from under the guy who loved her. The guy who'd slept with Bess backed away, putting his hands out in front of him like he wanted to push me away. And the look on his face said, hey man, it's not my fault, I'm just participating. The look on Tom's face as I walked past the guest room was like this. What the hell? You weren't supposed to be here. But the look of absolute horror on Anne's face I was sure I'd remember for years to come. Rick, her boss, had decided he was a real macho guy and jumped off the bed adopting something like a karate stance, and I just laughed at him. I knew how shit like that worked. If I attacked him, the cops would cuff me specifically because he was Anne's invited guest. If I could get him to attack me, I could kick his ass and get away with it. That's why I laughed at him. I didn't laugh at Big Bad Rick, I added to that laughter. 
You look ridiculous standing in a fake martial arts pose. This had an effect and he pounced on me. I did mention that I've been filming everything from the moment I walked in the door, right? I think he thought that because I was holding my phone up and filming, he would have a chance to hit me. And if he took that first shot, he could finish me off. As he lunged at me, I threw the phone at his face, and when he raised his hands to deflect the blow, I kicked him in the balls. He grabbed his crotch with his hands and fell to his knees. I walked over, grabbed the phone receiver, got him to his feet, locked his left arm in a headlock, and marched him across the house to the front door, then pushed him, naked, out onto the porch. I closed the door and turned on the porch light. While I was in the bedroom dealing with Macho Rick, Almost everyone else had gotten dressed and left, except for three people. Tom, who said he stayed to make sure I didn't hurt his sister. Steph, who said she would be there for Anne if she needed to be. And of course, Anne. Steph asked me what I was going to do, and I told her I was going to divorce Anne. Why? It was just recreational sex. There was no love involved. I don't think so. She made the same vows I did. I've felt lust for other women, but I've never gotten anything but lust. I've been madly in love with you since the day Anne introduced us, but I vowed to leave everyone else behind and never even give you a hint of how I felt. Anne made the same vows and broke them, and apparently this has been going on for some time now. I went back to the bedroom where Anne was sitting on the bed crying. I told her to stop crying and get out, she sobbed. I don't have to leave. This is my home, too. No, it isn't. Not anymore. Remember the prenup your father insisted I sign before we got married? Anne's family was quite wealthy, and her father wanted to make sure the family business stayed in family hands. I didn't care about his stupid business. All I wanted was his daughter, so I signed it without even bothering to read it, threw it in my desk drawer, and forgot about it, until my brother caught his wife cheating and divorced her. His wife acted like a thug and my brother was screwed. One night while we were having a drink at Bud's bar, he told me he wished he had a prenup like mine. Out of curiosity, I dug it out and read it. There was a clause about adultery that said, the guilty party dissolves the marriage with nothing but his clothes and what he has in his name. Everything Anne and I had was in common, so she was fooled. Anne got dressed and left, no doubt taking her naked boss with her. The next morning, I was at the bank when the doors opened. I closed all our accounts and opened new ones in my name only. I then found an attorney and started divorce proceedings. I also found out that we lived in a state that allowed dissolution of marital relationships. When I asked if it mattered that her boss also owned the company she worked for, he asked if I knew if the company had a corporate policies and procedures manual, and I said yes. He asked if I knew if there was a section in it about the relationship between the supervisor and someone he supervises, and I told him I was pretty sure there was. Anne had a copy of it at home, and I thought it was still there because all she had taken with her were her clothes. When I got home that evening, I looked, and the manual was still on the shelf in our home office. The next morning, I took it to my lawyer, and he read it and said, We got him! The papers were handed to Anne and her supervisor at work in the presence of everyone who worked there. Two days later, we received word from the other side. When I got home from work, Anne's father was sitting on the porch. After the greetings, which were cordial, were done, he asked if we could come inside and talk. Once inside, he asked, What's this nonsense about you divorcing Anne and kicking her out of the house? It's her house, too. I caught her cheating and kicked her out of the house. This is all because of you. Remember that agreement you made me sign before we got married? In the event of infidelity, the cheater leaves with only his clothes. Remember that? She's human, Bob. She makes mistakes like the rest of us. Anne loves you to death. I'm sure you can get over it. I know you love her. Maybe if it was a one-time misstep, but from what I found out, it's been going on for over a year and with more than one man. The agreement you signed was only to keep the business in the hands of the family. Then you should have worded it that way. The way you wrote it, it was obvious that if one of us cheated, he would get nothing. It's all your fault. You wrote it. You made me sign it. It's all on your conscience, Anne and you. You need to go easy on her, kid. If you force me to get her a lawyer, it could get messy. I took my cell phone out of my pocket, pressed the right buttons, and said, You want trouble? I'll give you trouble.
I held the phone up so he could see for himself what I had stumbled upon. He looked at it, then said with surprise, Wait, was that Tom? It was him. Then he heard it come from our bedroom. I'm almost done. Who's next? As I walked to the door, then he saw his darling daughter and her lover trying to get out of bed. I turned off the video and said, How unpleasant would it be for all your friends and family to get that personal copy? You wouldn't dare. Of course I would. You stay out of it, and the day the divorce becomes final, I will destroy it. No one but you, me, and my lawyer will ever see her again. You get a lawyer for Anne and fight the divorce, and I'll go nuclear. The choice is yours. Then he surprised me by pulling a .38 caliber revolver out of his pocket and told me to give him the phone. Why? What are you going to do with it? Delete the damn video. Okay, I said. Then there will be nukes. And I handed him the phone. He waved the gun in front of me and told me to move away and stand at the other end of the room. I did so, and then watched as he pushed buttons to delete what I had about his daughter. He hung up, stood up and said, see you in court, and walked out of the house. As soon as he left, I went to the computer and sent the video to my mother-in-law. Half an hour later, my father-in-law called. You disgusting son of a bitch, how could you do such a despicable thing as send that filth to my wife? I told you, if you mess with me, I'll nuke you. I can't believe you're stupid enough to think I won't have backup copies. So far, I've only sent this email to your wife. You make fun of me one more time, the whole world will see it. You asshole, he yelled and hung up the phone. He didn't hire a lawyer for Anne, and the divorce went through. I was a little surprised when Steph called me two days after the divorce. Did you really mean it when you said you had a crush on me? I did. I'm single tonight. I haven't had a relationship with a woman since I filed for divorce. It's probably old-fashioned, but I was still married and felt that I would also be a cheater if I did something with another woman while still married to Anne. The divorce was final and I needed help, so I asked her what she would like to do. How about dinner, drinks, and conversation? See what happens? I could do that. Pick you up at six o'clock? I'll be ready. That night, after dinner and drinks, I asked her about the time of her call. It's really quite simple. I know what kind of guy you are. I knew you wouldn't have a relationship with another woman while you were married. Was I wrong? No, you got me right. But how did you know I was single now? Anne was having problems at work, and when I asked her what happened, she said the divorce was final. You know she loves you, don't you? But not enough to stay faithful. It wasn't all her fault. The first time she was administered a date rape drug, and this asshole videotaped it, told her she belonged to him now and he could use her whenever he wanted or he'd make sure you had the video. It doesn't matter. If she had come to me after that first time and told me about it, we would probably still be together. But she didn't love me enough to trust me or believe in my love for her. Why are we ruining our date by talking about her? So what's next? And I've already told you that I like you, so the next step is up to you. My place or yours? My place is closer. Then why are we sitting here? It was exhausting. When I collapsed on the bed next to her, I thought I'd had enough. When we were done, she went to the bathroom and came back with a soapy rag and towel, which she used to wipe me down, saying, I want everything nice and ready for the first sex when we wake up in the morning. That was my first indication that Steph was going to stay the night. So I asked her what she was going to do the next day. She laughed and told me, I'm going to stay here and play with you. Would that work for you? I had something I was going to do, but nothing that I couldn't put off for another day. We lay in bed, and as I waited for sleep to come over me, I wondered where this would take us. I got the answer to that question the next morning at a late breakfast. We woke up cuddled against each other. We repeated this three times before we interrupted to go somewhere to eat. Over pancakes and bacon, she said, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. I'm not interested in a long-term relationship. I already know I'm not capable of staying faithful to any man, but if you're interested in a friendly relationship, I'd be all for it. I had no other plans, so I thought, why not? And told her to count on me. We spent the rest of Saturday and the first half of Sunday raping each other's bodies. Needless to say, she left me broken when she finally went home. She was still trying to get more when I couldn't even keep my eyes open. Three months into our relationship with Steph, my attorney called to let me know that my lawsuits had been settled, 
and after his fees were deducted, I was left with one and three-tenths million dollars. About a month after that, Steph told me that our relationship had reached an impasse, but she hoped we could remain friendly. I told her we could. Over the next six months, I dated a few different girls, and I managed to sleep with enough of them to be happy. But I never found the one I wanted to commit to. It was Tuesday night, and I walked into Tres Amigos for dinner. I was staring at the menu when the waitress came over to take my order. I ordered the homemade margarita, three enchiladas with cheese and onions, rice and beans, and the waitress said, Very good, senor. Perhaps you could see to it that I get home safely when I get home from work tonight. I looked at her in confusion and asked, What? Didn't you appoint yourself as my protector that night near the Ohinaga Presidio Bridge? Was that you? It was. I couldn't tell. You were all wrapped up and your head was covered with a scarf. I thought you'd be in Las Cruces. I couldn't get a job. There were a lot of people like me, far more than there were jobs. A cousin suggested I come to Denver because there were plenty of jobs I could find there. She looked at her watch and said, I have to deliver your order. Maybe we could talk later. She left to fulfill my order, and as she left, I noticed that she had an excellent figure, which matched her pretty face. I decided that maybe we should talk later.